Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Zubin Pratap and today I'm going to tell you why I taught myself to code at the age of 37. Hello there, welcome to my channel. Listen, after more than 12 years as a lawyer, I tried to start my own company. It was a startup and I was a non-technical founder. Sure, we managed to get a product to market, but you know what? I had a horrible time finding technical co-founders. In fact, I found a couple, but they ended up leaving. I was so sick of it. At the age of 37, I finally taught myself to code. But man, it wasn't easy. A year or so later, I ended up joining a startup as an engineer. And a year after that, I joined Google as an engineer. So listen, if you want to transition your career into tech, or you want to become your own technical co-founder, subscribe to my channel. Now, I hope you don't mind, but I'm standing in my kitchen because I'm actually boiling some tea. I really do enjoy making myself a bit of ginger tea every now and then. Um, I literally just grate some ginger into a saucepan, bring it to boil, and then, you know, add some tea and sugar and milk, perhaps a little bit too much sugar. I really shouldn't, but it's something I learned to do when I was growing up in India, and I love it. It's become a big part of my day. I have at least two to three cups of hot, spicy ginger tea every day and I love it. Anyway, let's get into the conversation today. I'm really keen to answer this question that I get a lot, which is why did you teach yourself to code at 37 and how did you even manage to do that? Now the how I'll cover in other videos, um, but I'll tell you why, because I think it's, it's an interesting story from my perspective, but also I hope it helps people realize that it's totally possible. I get so many people asking me, I'm 24, 25, is it too late to make a change? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I actually know one of my students um, was a nurse and she taught herself to code at 62 after she retired from nursing. Um, I mean, there's so many stories like this. So, you know, don't hold yourself back. Um, having said that, I did hold myself back for many years. So, all right, let's get into it. Now, for those of you who don't know, I was a career corporate lawyer for more than 12 years. I went on and did a few things after that as well, but for the most of my career, I've been a corporate lawyer. And I love being a lawyer, right? I was surrounded by really smart, super motivated, high initiative kind of people, and I had complex problems to solve, really great clients. I did deals that were worth as small as $20 million, all the way to you know more than $1.1 billion in transaction value. Like I've done some really exciting work globally, right? So being a lawyer was very rewarding, very lucrative, very satisfying in its own way. But the work was hard. There was not often the right sort of work-life balance. And it wasn't really a thing back then as much as it is now. Like 17 years ago when, you, when I was starting my practice in law, um, you know, the world was a bit different. Having said that, working with smart people, interesting challenges and work, sort of global work, you know, transactional work, I found that really exciting. However, as time went on, um, I started to realize that I was getting really good at spotting risk, getting less practice at spotting opportunity, but also there was a shift in the world, right? I did law school uh, at the end of the last century, so 98 to 2003, and the whole world changed in that time, right? Like Google suddenly became a thing during that point of time. The dot-com um, boom happened and the bust happened in that period of time. And so the entire world changed between 98 and 2003. And that was the time I was in law school. When I came out, as much as I loved being a lawyer, it was clear that the world had changed. We just didn't appreciate how much the world had changed. And then over the next few years, I realized all the action was moving en masse towards tech, right? All the action was happening in tech. First, it was you know, the startup world, um, and then mobile applications, and then cloud, and then machine learning, like there's been a steady shift towards technology being the anchoring force of humanity at the point of, at this point in time. And I was starting to feel a little bit left out in the law, not because I wasn't doing good work in the legal industry, I was probably doing some of the best work available. But I was starting to feel slightly disconnected from where the action was. And I knew that there was something even more exciting, a new frontier that was opening up, and I just felt that I wasn't getting to be part of it, not part of it enough for my liking, right? 
And so I started thinking, how do I get into this world? Um, and the skills as a lawyer, while they're very useful, they're not always the most easy to transfer across. They are transferable, but it's not often easy for other people to see how transferable they are. So then I embarked on the journey of trying to teach myself business skills, thinking going into the business world would be a stepping stone, et cetera, et cetera. I tried my hand at a few things, like trying to write some code, failed miserably three times, hired teams of developers overseas, built tiny little products, never managed to launch them. I was just experimenting, learning, making costly mistakes. Um, and then in 2017, by this time I had left the law and I was in a business role doing emerging technology and commercializing them. And I'm starting to work more with technologists. So over a period of five years, I directionally gotten closer to where I wanted to go, but I wasn't really in the tech world yet. I was still in an uh, in a conventional telco, a giant corporate a telco. Um, and so it wasn't quite the world I wanted. Anyway, 2017, I just quit cold turkey and I said, that's it, I'm going to do my own tech startup because I don't know how I'm going to get into the tech world otherwise. And if I can't get into it, uh, I faced a lot of rejections in job applications and so on and so forth. I said, okay, I know I want to be part of this world. I'm not able to access it yet. I need a bunch of skills and I need a story that shows that I'm completely committed to this world. So I quit, started my own tech startup. I was non-technical. And that was my first real effort at creating the world I wanted. Now, along the way, as you know, because tech was this rising tide, all the growth and industry opportunities started to gravitate towards tech. So there was such a boom in the market in the last decade that tons of new jobs were coming on, tons of new professions and skills that never existed you know, 15 years ago were now becoming mainstream. And so this rising tide was surging up around me. And there I was, this tiny little wannabe startup company, you know, non-technical founder, bobbing on the surface of this crazy tide, trying to find my own direction. And that's when I realized, okay, I'm probably not in possession of the kind of skills I need to make this tech company successful. I still wasn't technical. By this time, I'd found a technical co-founder with great difficulty, but he quit and it was really challenging. And then I decided, all right, you know what? I'm so sick of not being able to access this world of meeting resistance and failure after failure and disappointment and setback that I am just going to teach myself to code. When your baby leaves you all alone and nobody calls you on the phone don't you feel like crying? Don't you feel like crying? Now, I had a very attractive career, both in the business side. I'd done an MBA um, and also on the legal side waiting for me. And I've got to tell you, there was so much pull from that world. It was so hard to turn my back on that world because I knew I'd get a solid salary. I knew I'd have some amount of stability in my job. And I had all the runs on the board. I had some prestige and some reputation from the industries I, win, I was in. I could go back there, right? It was so easy to go back to that world. But I also knew that if I went back, I would never leave. I would never find it in me again to just quit cold turkey and try something. And so I made one decision that was pivotal in my life, and that was I will not look backwards. No matter what, no matter how tempting it is, and no matter how frightened I am in this moment and how bad the money situation looks, I am not going to look over my shoulder ever again. Forward is the only way through this hell, right? And so I said, okay, I'm going to teach myself to code because I can't find a technical co-founder. I have to close down my little startup, um, even though I got some modest traction. I'm going to teach myself. I tried to do that before, by the way, a few times. I tried to teach myself to code three times at that point in time, and I'd failed each time. It was just too hard. It was just too overwhelming, the amount of information and where to start, how much is enough, what do I do, which are the right resources, do I need to spend money, do I not? Like All these things were in my head. So I said, okay, I'm just going to quit and do it. And over the next six months, I literally sat down at my kitchen table and taught myself to code. I used my diary of the past failed attempts to figure out all the things I shouldn't do this time. And that became my playbook for how to teach myself to code. And it wasn't easy. Anyway, did that. 
And the view was, I'm going to become my own technical co-founder. Now, if you look at Free Code Camp, you'll see a blog from a few years ago, which talks about how to become your own technical co-founder. And so I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be my own technical co-founder. I'm never going to rely on somebody else again if I want to build a product. And that was my goal. Off I went, right. Taught myself a bit of code. And then I realized, you know what? I haven't earned income in a couple of years now. Um, and this is really hard. Um, my wife is super supportive, but I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't leading the successful life I wanted yet. And so I said, okay, I don't know what my next startup idea is going to be but I'm going to try and continue to get paid to learn by being good enough to get a job as a developer. And so I did become a junior developer at a small startup here in Melbourne, one of my favorite jobs of all time, and kept learning, kept growing, but at least this time I was drawing a tiny salary. It was so much smaller than my last drawn salary in the corporate world, so much smaller, but it was, you know, it was something. Kept the lights on. And by this time, I'd realized there was so much creative potential in being a developer. Like, it's just such a creative role. You can make magic happen when you write code. It's really hard to get to that point. But once you do, it's almost limitless in what you can do. And I loved that, right? That was everything to me. The fact that I could be almost unlimitedly, and I know that's not a word, but unlimitedly creative, right? It was so exciting. And so I loved being a developer. And then I figured, well, hang on. Um, if I'm going to do this, how far can I take this, right? I'd always learned that it was important for me to be surrounded by people way better than myself and to always have really big goals. And I've realized in life that there is a system to achieving goals. Now, you may not always achieve it, but the only way you have a chance of achieving it is by following a sort of system. And the system that worked for me was the one I applied. Keep in mind, I did not want to be a professional software engineer when I started this journey, and I certainly did not want to join a big corporate like Google, but that's where I ended up setting my sights next. And so a couple of years after teaching myself to code and being you know, in the small startup for, for a brief period, I applied to Google and I prepared for the interview and I got into Google. And that's where I'm an engineer today. So this entire journey has been one of following my dream to be part of tech, to be part of something really exciting. And I've got to tell you, there are a whole bunch of unexpected advantages. One is, I am surrounded by a bunch of people who are not just smart and creative, but they actually want to do things with that power, right? They've got the superpower and they want to do things. I can't tell you how exciting it is to be immersed in an environment where everyone has their heart, in the, or most people have their heart in the right place and want to do things with their new superpower, with the ability to code and make products, right? That, that actually could help people. That's one. The second thing is, I have never, in 18 years of being in the labor market, been in an environment where job opportunities are flying at you, and I'm talking half a dozen, a dozen a week, just flying at you, they're just incoming, right? I'm not saying they're making you offers, I'm saying they're inviting you to interview. And those of you who've been in the job market a while know it's it's so much harder to get the interview than it is to actually crack the interview. I know all the focus is on doing well at the interview, but most people don't get the interview statistically, right? And so statistically, I believe it's harder to even get an interview. I've never been in an industry where so many offers just keep coming in, right? And I've been at the top of the legal industry, I've done well in, in other industries, it's always been more of an outreach to get your next role, okay? Sometimes there'll be some incoming, you know, maybe one or two a month. But I've never been in a situation where literally every morning I'll have one or two emails, cold outreaches from recruiters and others asking if I'm interested in an interview. And to me, that's just a mindset shift, right? To realize that it's possible to give yourself the skills in this day and age to be a non-traditional applicant for these kind of roles and then be in an industry where people are always looking for more talent and mobility is part of the deal, right? It's hugely exciting. I can't tell you what it does in terms of my sense of security, my terms of confidence for knowing that no matter what happens next, I have skills that have value in the market and I can find interesting opportunities with less effort than ever before. Now, I'm not saying there's no effort. I'm not saying things come easy. And more times than not, you will fail in your process when you're you know, applying for jobs and doing the interviews. Most people fail in interviews. That's normal. But never before has there been so much opportunity coming at me, right? Hugely exciting. 
So that's sort of a quick summary of how I ended up teaching myself to code. Now, when I started my startup, I was 36. When I decided I was going to teach myself to code, I was 37. And it's really important that you realize that it doesn't matter which age you're at. What ends up happening is that at certain stages in your life, it gets harder to allocate time. But ultimately, this is all about allocating time and energy to the best resources that get you to your goal. Right? There are no shortcuts. There are just efficient paths. And efficient paths are dictated by your circumstances, your learning style, and your context and your goals. So while there's no one size fits all, it is totally possible for anybody. And I hope that I'm living proof to many of you. Now, here's an interesting fact, right? A lot of people think it's crazy that a lawyer would suddenly become a coder. After I became a coder and I published a couple of articles about it, I have met personally 16 people around the world as of today, 16 people who are ex-lawyers turned coders, okay? And I met a ton from other backgrounds as well. Here's my point, that just because you don't know it's possible doesn't mean it is. The moment it becomes possible for you, suddenly there are people everywhere like you, right? The world is a very big place and possibilities are endless. So don't think that because you're 25 or 60 or 40 or whatever it is, you can't make the change. The only cash is you've got to want it bad enough to invest in yourself. And it comes at the cost of a lot of sacrifice, usually finances, financial and time. So you're either spending money or you're not earning money or both. And you're putting in a ton of time to make that career change. But without that difficulty, the opportunities wouldn't be there. That difficulty creates a little bit of scarcity. It creates a unique story for you and it builds your confidence more than anything else. You suddenly become so much more confident about what you can do in your life and the opportunities you can create for yourself if you decide to make that effort and pay that price. All right, I hope this has been useful. If you've listened this far, please like, please subscribe to this channel. I'll keep sharing more of my lived experiences on my journey with you. And I hope to learn from you as well. So please drop in some comments as well. And remember by doing these things, by liking, subscribing and commenting, not only are you embedding a lesson in your head, you're also helping other people achieve their potential and self-actualize. And hey, we live in a world where it's possible. Never before has it been this accessible to so many. So let's do it. I'll see you next time.